Hello, welcome everyone to the virtual lunch in the forest. We're excited today to launch our last session of this semester and it's wonderful to have you all here today. First, I wanted to recognize that we are broadcasting to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish people. Second, I wanted to just briefly say a couple words about this, uh, this initiative. Part of the virtual lunch in the forest is to talk about equity, diversity, and anti-racism from fresh perspectives and hear new voices. And we have our host, Estefania Mila Moreno, to thank for coming up with the design of this webinar and putting all the speakers together for us. And so it's been uh, a, a tremendous uh, joy and honor to share this semester with all of you for these different discussions. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Estefania. Thank you so much, um, Sara. We're very grateful um, to having uh, the opportunity to talk with Ariel today in the last webinar of Having Lunch in the Forest. Ariel is a two-spirit Chinook, Kalapuya, and South Salish person from the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and goes by they, them. They recently graduated from the Natural Resources Conservation Science and management major in spring of 2020. They currently work as a research assistant in a lab in the Faculty of Forestry and plan on continuing their studies there. How are you doing, Ariel? I'm doing pretty good today. How are you, Estefania? Good, thank you. We're gathering around lunchtime and I, I'm curious to ask you, what is your favorite dish? Oh, I feel like I have a lot of favorite dishes, but specifically what I had today was, uh, at risk of being a cliche, I had avocado toast. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll say avocado toast, but I have lots of favorite lunches. Thank you. Um, we have many people attending uh, to this webinar, and I'd like to kindly invite you all to share from which location you are joining today. We are now broadcasting from the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Mascan people. And it'd be nice if you haven't already uh, that you go and visit na native.land.ca to learn about the indigenous lands you are located. Um, I am going to start um, sharing the presentation that Ariel prepared uh, for this. Uh, conversation and I would like to invite you Ariel to to tell us a little bit more about you and your experiences as an indigenous scholar in forestry. Yeah. Um Hayumasi Kapanihoi Yakunaga Monkwa Uguk Ushla. Talochiam Naganam Nagachaku Kapu Uguk Yetla Shingama Slasta Uguk Monk Uskan Shapaya the Payash Kapa Ikitati Nagachaku Kapa Uguk Nishelit Stawa, Laska Luluk Ilipe Gunat, Kapa Monk Ulapiki, Nagachaku Kapa Uguk Shwati Imash, Laska Monk Paputo, Kapa Numaluschuk. Hi, my name is Ariel. I graduated from the Natural Resource Conservation Program in May of this year, and I've just taken the time to introduce myself and where I'm from in my native language. Um, like a lot of coastal indigenous peoples, I can walk back my lineage to several different nations across what we now call the Pacific Northwest. So I'm a Grand Ronde tribal member. Uh, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde is located um, in Northwestern Oregon in the Coast Range. But the specific nations that I come from are the Skamesh Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and the Salmon River South Salish, or Nehalem Tivinlux. And I'm also English and Irish through my father's side. 
Um, but yeah, like I said, my tribal nations now congregate around the Confederation of Grand Ronde because this is where we were removed to in the 1800s when forced removals occurred throughout the Western United States. People from Southern Washington all the way down to Northern California were removed to Grand Ronde. So we're a confederation that speaks something like 26 different languages traditionally. Um, so the language that I was speaking to you just now is Chinookwawa, which is a trade pigeon language that was created pre-colonization to help everybody in the area communicate with each other. But once colonizers began coming in, we also introduced aspects of English and French and a whole bunch of other languages to it to aid in mutual conversation between people who speak many different languages. So this is the language that we now speak on Grand Ronde, and we've been reviving it for about 20 years now. So we have a lot of language learners in our nation, which is very exciting. So today I'm going to speak to you a bit about my own personal experience as an Indigenous person in the Faculty of Forestry and where I think Indigenous content may be lacking within our faculty. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of things. First of all, that I am just one Indigenous person out of many Indigenous nations all across Canada and the US, as well as across the world. So we are not a monolith. There's an incredibly diverse set of experiences that comes along with being Indigenous. And my experience is just one of those. And as well, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm not affected by colorism. So I'm white passing. And though this doesn't make me any less Indigenous, this does mean that I am not able to speak to the experiences of a dark-skinned person or a dark-skinned Indigenous person even, either in this faculty or in the broader world. I can only speak to my own personal experiences as a white passing Indigenous person. So if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, one of the first things that I wanted to discuss today is traditional knowledge and how this is used in our faculty and the origins of that term and how I think we could be better incorporating indigenous knowledge practices into our faculty. So these are some images from my own tribal nations. This uh, image on the left is a image from our tribal canoe journeys, which is a practice that we began reviving in the 1990s, I believe, where uh, tribal nations all across Oregon and Washington and British Columbia and Alaska converge on a single village or tribal nation each summer to conduct protocol, which is the sharing of dances and language and singing, as well as to share traditional foods and other traditional practices with each other and to generally just keep those kinship ties that we've been building since time immemorial strong. Since these were practices that were banned with the potlatch ban in Canada and a whole bunch of other bans and terminations in the United States, we have been working very hard to revive these things. Um, the middle picture is us reviving our traditional uh, lamprey or stock wool harvest at Willamette Falls or Ikatsiki. So these are some of our tribal members harvesting lamprey eels from the bottom of Willamette Falls and I know that may seem strange. I feel like a lot of people don't think that we, anyone would want to eat eels, but they're actually really delicious. <laughs> um, in this third picture here is a traditional bird that our Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde are conducting on Cascade Head, which is right on the coast of Northern Oregon. And it's a place where we've harvested traditional bulb plants and traditional seed plants for thousands and thousands of years. And since the exclusion of fire from that landscape, a lot of Douglas birds and spruce has kind of invaded into the prairie up there. And so since about 2008, we've started burning there again so that we can revive our traditional plant systems, which provide us with food and they provide us with fibers for netting and fibers for weaving. So that's another very important revival of traditional knowledge that we have been completing on our own landscapes. So these, this was my understanding of traditional knowledge before I came to academia. This was kind of how I saw our knowledge systems. They were something that we practiced. There was something that were shared between family members and through kinship groups all across the coast. 
And so I came to university here and traditional knowledge seems to be one of the first and only pieces of indigenous content in my courses that we ended up ever covering. Um, for the sake of this conversation, I'll just define traditional ecological knowledge if no one has ever heard the term, just kind of as the accumulated knowledge of indigenous peoples across generations in time, or the accumulated knowledge of living with and within the landscape since time immemorial. Now there's a lot of complexity there and that's not a super like robust definition for the term, but I also don't particularly believe in robust definitions in academia for indigenous terms. So that is what I will say here today. And one of the things that I found difficult to integrate into my own systems of knowledge that I've been learning for my entire life is the fact that oftentimes we call this traditional ecological knowledge. So the, and this kind of implies to me that indigenous peoples only have knowledge on ecology and that there's only traditional knowledge relating to ecological processes when in reality our indigenous knowledge systems are much more complex than that they encompass entire political systems they encompass government structures they encompass our traditional economies our religious systems our food systems and our languages and they're very much so not a static system so I found that traditional knowledge is often portrayed in our faculty or in our courses as a system of the past, a system that is static and rigid. And I've heard the term ancient thrown around a lot. Um, so yeah, these systems are old. They're inherently old because they're passed generationally within our families and with our kinship ties and within our nations. But they're also new and they're also growing and they're also so much more complex and diverse than I think we ever covered in any of my classes. And we also have this tendency to want to cherry pick or kind of pick specific aspects of traditional knowledge that we think would integrate nicely into academia and integrate nicely into Western science and kind of use those as the only piece of traditional knowledge that we bring in. So we like to operationalize traditional knowledge for our own benefits in academia, um, either, whether this is being professors or researchers furthering their own success or clout in academic circles by incorporating indigenous knowledge or just trying to integrate pieces of knowledge that are not your own, like they don't belong to you. And I very, very earnestly believe that this is a form of extractivism that we're participating in extractivism by cherry picking or taking pieces of knowledge from indigenous groups without the broader context of that knowledge or without performing an equal share of wealth with that knowledge. So I think in our faculty, we really need to be teaching our undergrads more of these complexities of traditional knowledge. We need to be teaching our undergrads that these are not just ecological systems, that they're not static systems, that they're very much so alive and very much so evolving with time. And they're going to be evolving continually into the future, especially as the effects of climate change start being felt more strongly on this landscape. Our traditional knowledge systems are going to be evolving with that because they're so inextricably tied to the land and ecological processes on the land. So though I think that yields some very interesting possibilities for uh, collaborations with Western science and collaborations with academia, I think for research purposes, if we're going to be working with indigenous communities and using this traditional knowledge, it needs to be ind indigenous initiated research. Uh, people need to be paid for their time and their effort and that we need to make sure that we're coming to the table as equal partners and offering equal exchanges and making sure that we listen to communities to what their needs are instead of assuming what their needs are and kind of placing that onto them. We need to be listening, we need to be learning, and we need to be paying people for their time. And I think there's really good examples of this uh, within our faculty and elsewhere, but I think that I just really need to stress that that's very important if we're going to be teaching and using traditional ecological knowledge. Can you please share with us um, some examples of uh, successful 
um, interchange amongst uh, indigenous scholars in academia? I mean, I don't wanna, <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoy what uh, people in my own lab are doing. Um, <laughs> shout out to the Tree Ring Lab, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think there's some really, really interesting, important work going on that I really do feel like are equal exchanges of knowledge and equal exchanges of wealth. And I feel that there's ways that academics can treat indigenous communities with respect and as autonomous groups that don't just feel a lot less extractive like it feels like we're building relationships with community but it also is just making sure that we are paying people for their time that if there are funding opportunities to help indigenous nations out with resources or supplies i guess that the government isn't providing them because Canadian government is very stingy and very racist with how it allocates resources to Indigenous bands. So if there are things in academia that we can be doing to help, if there are pieces of knowledge that we can be exchanging with Indigenous communities that will help people on both sides grow and help people on both sides expand their own knowledges and expand their own capacities, then I think that's the ideal situation when we're working with traditional knowledge, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, you want to go to the next slide? So, oh, actually, do you want to go to another slide? I just talked about all of this. <laughs> yeah, um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about, and I'll try to go through this quickly, um, is that even though I studied conservation in this faculty, I felt like our conversations on industry were very unnuanced, especially from an indigenous lens. So I'll briefly go over what is happening in some of these photos. Um, this photo, this big photo on the left is 1993 Cleoquot Sound, where there are forestry or forest industry workers standing side by side with armed RCMP officers, reading an injunction to Cleoquot and Nahauset peoples who are protecting their own traditional territories that they have 10 minutes to leave the area or they're going to be forcibly removed by the RCMP. And the top image on the right is from 2020. So this year, February or yeah, February of this year, when the RCMP came into Gidimthin and Unistoten territories with armed with assault rifles to forcibly remove people who were not only protecting land from a pipeline expansion, but also from, uh, they were protecting their healing house. So there's a, a healing house where people are reclaiming traditional land practices up on that land. And the pipeline path goes directly through that house. So these people were trying to protect that and were invaded on by what very much so looks like army officials within Canada. And the lower picture is also from 2020. This is from, I guess, just last month in Mi'kmaq territory or in Mi'kmaq. Um, this is a lobster compound that indigenous fishers were uh, storing their lobster and white lobster industry actors came in and kind of collectively ransacked the place. They also tried to burn down a building which was containing two indigenous fishermen and barely nearly killed them. And so these are just examples of how industry, like still to this present day, is forcibly removing indigenous peoples from their territory and from the landscape. And you might be wondering why I think this is related to forestry. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is that we're a forestry school on unceded indigenous land. And the history of this faculty, a history that I personally believe we haven't really begun to unpack or reckon with is the history of forest industrial extraction. So most of the wealth of the forest industry in BC is stolen wealth. Like that's not really disputable. The timber that we harvest comes from unceded land. And unless that land has been ceded by treaty, and even then it's ethically dubious, but unless that land has been ceded by treaty, we're on 
unceded territory and therefore any extraction that isn't approved by traditional government structures is stolen. So I think we need to be talking about industry in our classes. Like our faculty produces the next generation of forest industry workers. And if we're not learning about the history of forest industry and not just the history, but the present, like this wealth is still stolen. Um, how are people expected to go out into the world and be the next generation of industry workers if they're not going to be learning about the nuances of indigenous rights and indigenous land management within this own, like within our own faculty. Uh, you wanna go to the next slide? And I think personally that the same goes for social issues that indigenous people are suffering in this country. So all of these social issues that are here, whether it be a uh, lack of clean water, lack of stable housing, or the epidemic of our missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people, these are all issues that are very much so tied to land and land and extraction from the land and industry. Like a lot of these water sources are being polluted by pipelines and by dams. Uh, a lot of people are unhoused because of both historical and present removals from land. And there have been ties that have been proven between missing and murdered indigenous women and industry man camps, including forestry industry man camps. So these are not issues that we can separate from our own complicity in industry. And I think that I never heard any of my professors talk about missing and murdered indigenous women, or at least not like in depth, like it would be mentioned, but never in depth, like why this was happening, like what needs to change. And I think that's the same with water issues. That's the same with issues of unhoused indigenous people. We, we never talk about these social issues, which um, if you go to the next slide, I got a little angry about. <laughs> so in the beginning of 2020, this was a time that Ginnemden and Unistoten were being actively invaded by the RCMP. And also the indigenous youth in BC had taken over the BC legislature and set up camp there to, not just to protest the pipelines, but to protest reconciliation, essentially. So they, our, our youth declared that reconciliation was dead. And I think maybe I should go a little bit into that. Um, I hear, cause I hear a lot of people in forestry talk about reconciliation and how it's what we need to be doing to repair our relationship to indigenous peoples. And as far as I know, you can't repair something that's always been broken. Like that's called building. That's not called repairing because it's never been there. You can't repair it. And you also can't fix something and reconcile something as long as atrocities are still being committed. So when we talk about reconciliation, that's really just a buzzword. That's really just something that settler Canadians have created to ease their own guilt at the complicity that they have in colonial systems. So I created this space of ceremony at the Reconciliation Poll to bring awareness in our faculty and also just to the greater UBC community about some of these social and environmental issues that Indigenous peoples were going through at this time period. Uh, so this, include most, this included mostly a ceremonial space to honor missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people because this was in February, which is right around the same time as the big missing and murdered Indigenous Women's March in downtown Vancouver. And I had also recently lost one of my own relatives, my cousin Ocean, to the missing and murdered indigenous women crisis. They found her, her body in a ditch on a forestry road in Oregon. And the police down there had never looked for her and didn't believe us when we said that she was missing. They said that she was off partying somewhere. And this is a story that I hear echoed so many times around Canada and the US that, oh, they were never looked for and they were found in areas of high industrial activity. So I really felt compelled personally to 
bring this issue to the forefront in our faculty and in this area. And also just to create a space of ceremony for my own personal healing, because this was a very, very difficult thing for me to go through. And I know that other Indigenous students in forestry are going through the same things and feeling the same frustrations at not having our voices heard and not having our issues discussed in our classes, even though it's so inextricably tied to land and wealth and all of the things that we do talk about with forestry. So created this space. It was up for a few months before it was destroyed by UBC custodial services. Uh, during that time, we were harassed by UBC security. I was harassed by forestry students who sat next to me in my classes. They would come up to me and tell me how incorrect I was and tell me that pipelines had consent from elected chief and councils and all of these things that were just very, very uneducated. And, you know, I did spend the time to try to talk to these people and tell them my point of view, but people are very, very closed off when they hear these kinds of things. I don't know if it's because of guilt or if it's because of just pure miseducation and uneducation, but people are very, very closed off when they try to talk about these things. So that was the purpose of this space. I'm sure many people walking by, walking to the forestry building every day saw this as they were coming in and maybe had questions, maybe didn't know what was going on, saw it changing so much, saw things being removed and put back up. But um, I think the red dresses end up staying for quite a few months, which was really, really healing for me and for a few other Indigenous students in forestry and Indigenous students from other parts of campus too. We would do ceremony here every week and every week we'd have more and more people coming to ceremony. So that was a really amazing experience and did kind of help to heal some of these wounds that I felt I had occur incurred from the silence that is in our faculty on a lot of these issues. All of this to say that um, I think forestry does do a really good job talking about certain issues. Like I am very glad that we incorporate indigenous knowledges into our classes because I know some faculties at this school haven't even gotten that far. And there are really amazing examples of groups in forestry and individuals in forestry doing really, really amazing work, uh, whether they are indigenous or settlers with indigenous knowledges and indigenous groups around Canada. I just think that as a faculty in general, as a collective, we need to examine our places in these systems. We need to examine how as individuals we contribute to systems of oppression and not just indigenous systems of oppression. We're talking about systems of oppression against black people, systems of oppression against queer and trans people, systems of oppression against people with disabilities. Like this goes further than just indigenous issues because all of these things are connected. These are all connected back to the root ideologies of white supremacy and colonization and capitalism. So we all really need to examine our own biases and what we're bringing into the classroom because our own individual biases do come into the classroom. And when they do, they can seriously affect and harm our students of color and in our indigenous students and our students who are otherly abled and our queer and trans students. So we really examine our place in these systems. I think if we have generational wealth, we should be trying to distribute our generational wealth as best as possible. I think we need to be rethinking the term reconciliation and how we relate to reconciliation on a personal level and on an institutional level. And I also think we need to do more than land acknowledgements because I hear a lot of land acknowledgements and I think they're great. I think it's important to acknowledge whose land you are on, but we need to take it a step further from that. We need to redistribute wealth. We need to, uh, especially since that's stolen wealth, especially in the uh, case of forestry. And we really need to be weaving more of this indigenous content, especially social issues and environmental issues into our curriculum if we want our students to graduate with a more well-rounded approach to interacting with indigenous peoples in their own careers. Thank you so much, Ariel. And I'm sorry to hear about um, your loss. And, and I, I am very grateful of uh, you coming and, and sharing this with us. I did see the uh, dresses and the 
installation you made uh, and it, it was a good opportunity to talk as a family of settlers and also uh, see some similar, quite similar struggles from the First Nations from Latin America. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I, I thank you for that as well. I see uh, Lori raising the hand. So um, I think uh, Lori, if, if you can, you could put uh, a question or comment in the Q&A or in the chat and I can read it or uh, you can tell me in the chat if you wanna talk uh, and I can try to link you to, so you can talk directly. Um, in the meantime, yeah, so let me, oops, sorry. Just one second. Perfect. So, thank you, thank you so much uh, for this. While we wait for Lori, um, I think she just uh, did. I just wanted to clap. Lori says, but thank you to Ariel for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, so before we move on to the Q and A. Um, I'd like to remind uh, people to continue to use that feature. And um, I think that I, I'm curious to know if, if you can think of, of a good example of reconciliation or true um, reparation uh, elsewhere uh, that you can share with us. Yeah, so I think on a whole, Canada and the US and I guess the rest of the world as well. It's hard to think of examples of true reconciliation. Because um, I think there's just a lot of people out in the world that aren't thinking about what the Indigenous perspective on reconciliation is. They're just trying to assuade their own guilt at complicity in systems. I would say that the, the best examples of true reconciliation that I've seen are, are land back issues. And so I can't believe I got through a, like a 20 minute presentation without saying the word land back. Um, so land back is just um, the giving or re-gifting or returning of lands back to the, their own traditional owners. And so I see this in Canada and I see this in the States where people have inherited land from their family members and they've gone through the process of attempting to return that to its traditional owners, whether it's farmland or a piece of forest that they are no longer using or even if they are using it, they're like moving and trying to uh, re-gift it or just not re-gift because it's not a gift, it's a return. Like just, yeah, like returning pieces of individually owned land back to indigenous peoples. And I mean, if Canada is really serious about reconciliation, it could start returning its crown lands to indigenous peoples. But um, as far as individual actions, those are some really big and important ones that I can think of on the spot. Thank you. I, I would also like to ask if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about your traditional name. Uh, yeah, I can. So part, some of it is closed practice. Some of it is stuff that I'm not allowed to share with people who are outside my immediate family and my immediate kinship systems. But yeah, so my, my ancestral name is Salat Cheyam. It translates very, very vaguely to uh, a lone grizzly bear wandering around at night. And so these are, in our groups, these are traditional names that are passed on from our own personal ancestors. So the last person to hold the name Tselechiam was my great grandfather on my grandmother's side. So these are names that once someone passes, that name has a lot of power and it is passed on to another family member within your kinship system. So when I was old enough to be gifted a ancestral name, I was gifted this name by some elders and people in, within my nation who knew the last person who held my name and um, 
recognized the same spirit within both of us. And so this was the name that I was gifted. And if I would have been a different person, I probably would have been gifted a different name. So I don't know how these processes, but <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a kinship name that is passed uh generationally within our system so i don't actually know how old this name is it's at least partially rooted within shinakawa instead of the traditional languages that my own nations actually spoke so like kiksh or sakames or um nehalem or atlati so it can't be that old as a name but it does go back at least three generations or three name holders, which is about six or seven generations. So it's a pretty old name. I feel really, really lucky and grateful to be gifted a name because not everyone has that privilege. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I have many questions that I would like to ask. Uh, you can you can respond them or not as, as you wish. And some others are coming in the Q&A and we thank the people for sending them. Um, uh, I would like to ask you if you could share with us a little bit about uh, of your journey as a two-speed person and, and how important are the personal pronouns perhaps in the academic settings. Yeah, so two-spirit's a bit of a tricky thing um, because two-spirit isn't a traditional term. Um, like all, a lot of indigenous nations around Turtle Island at least, I don't really know about further than that, but a lot of nations around Turtle Island have many different genders traditionally, and they all have their own names and they all have their own roles within nations. And a lot of that knowledge within my own nations has been lost. I don't know the traditional words for my identity, for who I am. So I use Two Spirit because that's the best name that I have for it. But I, yeah, I consider myself Chan. I identify as two-spirit, but um, I do present as femme. So it's, uh, it's a bit tricky and complex of an identity, but um, yeah, I definitely, I use they, them pronouns. I definitely prefer they, them pronouns. And um, yeah, it's, I just, I walk around the world, especially when I present more masculine, like I have my hair long right now, but a lot of the time I wear my hair short and I walk around the world presenting more androgynously and definitely receive criticism and harassment for that. Um, especially in rural areas, I feel like people aren't ready to see like a short haired person like rocking makeup and like really long earrings. It's just like a weird thing to see. So um, yeah, but navigating that in academia, I, I mean, I, even though I do identify as trans, I do present as the sex that I was born as. So I don't really experience that transphobia in the same way as a lot of other people have. I haven't medically transitioned. I don't, so I don't experience any kind of um, medical transphobia like a lot of people do. And so queerness is just something that really enriches my life. It really enriches my identity, but I haven't experienced too many horrible things within forestry as far as the that aspect of my identity. I mean, there's always homophobic people everywhere, but I wouldn't say in academia it's any more prominent than anywhere else. Um, this will be the last question I, I, I ask before we go to the q and I, I see a lot of people asking questions, so we'll, we'll be there in a sec. Um, Vancouver, uh, we came to realize when we came here, it's a very, very multicultural place. And, and I am interested to know how involved you've seen the international community at UBC when learning about First Nation issues? Um, I'd say that it, the onus is really on our courses to make sure that our indigenous students or our uh, international students are educated in indigenous issues. Because I mean, people come here, I mean, I'm international, but I'm obviously like from, from Oregon and also I'm indigenous. So I have all these experiences, but I can imagine coming from all places all over the world, especially places that don't acknowledge indigenous identity or existence. It would be really tricky to come here and have all of these nuances with traditional land management and indigenous social issues and environmental issues and have very little education on it. 
because obviously the places you're coming from probably aren't talking about First Nations people. We barely talk about First Nations people. So <laughs> I imagine it would be like very, very difficult to come here and be able to have those like educated and nuanced conversations on these issues unless we're being educated by, about those issues by our own courses. And we are very much so not being educated about these issues in our courses. Like we talked about residential schools in, in two classes in one course that I had. And in the second part of that class, we were asked to talk about all the benefits of residential schools. So this long story short, like we don't talk about indigenous social issues. And when we do, they're oftentimes the, not the most nuanced conversations. So I really think like the onus needs to be on our courses and on the faculty to teach international students about indigenous issues so that people can come to the table and actually have conversations about these things. Thank you. So we're going to jump. Uh, we have a question from Catherine Croque. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, Catherine. Hawe, hello, and we Balhan Tanga. Thank you so much. I am from the co nation of what is currently known as Oklahoma. I am wondering if you have specific things you would like to see in the Faculty of Forestry as a group of as a group or institution or as individuals to support indigenous sovereignty and the well-being of indigenous students on campus uh, and also in the Faculty of Forestry. Yeah, wow, I think that's so important. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I think the fact of the matter is that I felt very unsupported coming through the Faculty of Forestry. I, I felt very disconnected from the Longhouse and other Indigenous students on campus just because like geographically we're very far from the Longhouse, but also we don't have a lot of shared participation in a lot of different things. So for a while we had uh, Indigenous initiatives in forestry and we were doing uh, social days and like movie nights and beating circles and these kinds of things with forestry indigenous students and I thought that was that was really amazing it was really amazing to get to to sit with and see the fact that there are other indigenous students in forestry because I feel like especially in the beginning it wasn't clear to me that there was like I saw very few at least visibly indigenous students within forestry so I think definitely bringing back spaces that are specifically meant for us not just to to talk about like our experiences and courses but also just to like meet each other and socialize would be really important i also think it would be very very important for forestry and ubc in general to acknowledge the existence of international indigenous students um i'm sure other people have run into the problem with the fact that because we're on the other side of the medicine line or the border between canada and us that we are not eligible for a lot of the same services and supports as Canadian Indigenous students are. So I think breaking down those colonial barriers in access to support and services is really essential to making sure that we have good systems in place for our, our Indigenous students, both social systems and uh, institutional systems with uh, as far as like funding and therapy and all of the things that Canadian Indigenous students have access to that sometimes international students have a really hard time accessing. So yeah, I think those are a couple of things that would really, really help build Indigenous community in forestry and also across campus. Thank you. As a forestry alumni, how did, you, how did a low representation of Indigenous professors affect your motivation as an Indigenous student? And do you feel confident that if you choose to become a researcher or professor, that UBC Forestry will provide you with the opportunities and support you need to attain your desired career goals? Um, I would have loved to have a role model, I think. I would have really, really loved to be able to come in and take required courses that were taught by female Indigenous professors or even just indigenous professors like I never had an indigenous professor throughout my entire undergrad I had a few guest lectures from indigenous professors that I really really loved but didn't have their own courses at the time um, so I think I would have been a lot more motivated to talk about indigenous issues and less afraid to talk about indigenous issues and afraid of being told that I talked about indigenous issues too much, which has happened 
to me on multiple occasions in my own classes. So I think having indigenous professors really would have like kind of assoyed or helped alleviate that fear within me. And I think I would have come out of my own shell a lot earlier and embraced my identity and fought for more change in the faculty earlier if I had role models to look up to. And there was a second half of that question and I don't remember it. Let me go back to it. The other <laughs> part is, um, and do you feel confident that if you choose to become a researcher or professor, UBC Forestry will provide you with the opportunities and support you need to attain your desired career goals? I think in the end, that's all about individuals more than forestry as a collective. Like at the end of the day, if and when I decide to pursue more education, like that's all gonna be about who I decide to study with and what my funding opportunities are. Um, I do have confidence that UBC Forestry, at least within like the five years that I was there, has gotten a lot better and has improved with engagement with Indigenous students and has improved with opportunities for Indigenous students. And like, yeah, I do feel that if I were to continue much further in academia, there would eventually be places for me when I get to that spot. Do I feel like there's places right now for a lot of Indigenous professors and Indigenous staff? Not particularly, but I feel that that's the direction we need to go to. And, um, you know, like if I ever end up getting a PhD and become a postdoc and then become a professor, like that's a little ways down the road. And I think by then there's gonna be, I mean, there needs to be a lot more opportunities. So the answer is yes, because there needs to be. Mm. Um, do you feel respected as a scholar or do you often feel tokenized for being indigenous scholar? I think in the spaces that I am right now, I feel respected. There's definitely been points in my undergraduate degree where I've felt tokenized, um, where I felt like I, I have to be the one to talk about indigenous issues because no one else is gonna do it for me. Or once I have identified myself as indigenous, like professors will say something about indigenous peoples and then like, look at me. <laughs> And I'm like, what do you want me to do? Argue with you? I'm not like, that's not my job. Like I shouldn't have to do that labor. Um, so I would say definitely there was points within my courses that I felt like if I didn't speak up and challenge professors on some really whack views that they had that it wouldn't get done. But I feel like in the spaces that I am in right now, like working and studying, I feel much more comfortable being able. But I think that's just about cultivating and manifesting the spaces around you. Like, I had to work to get to the place where I feel comfortable talking about these issues. Thank you. So another question is, you discuss the visits uh, from different indigenous people to each other using the picture of the canoes. The nature of resources and people is that they don't really follow artificial borders and boundaries. Can you speak to the ties among people along the coast, but also what this might imply for interacting with natural resource systems? Yeah, for sure. Oh, wow. I love talking about breaking down borders. Um, yeah, like uh, I know that along the Salish continuum, which is the like kind of the term just to talk about Salish peoples all the way down from the coast of Oregon, all the way up into British Columbia, like we all interacted with each other, like via canoes, we all traded with each other, we traded language, we had shared pieces of language, we had shared economies, we participated in each other's political systems. And that was lost for a while when we were, um, well not lost, but fell asleep for a while when we were very constrained in geographically to reservations. But it's definitely being revived now. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel like this is especially pertinent with fisheries management just because oceans don't follow borders, fish don't follow borders, and fish are also like very important economic, political, religious, cultural system to indigenous peoples. I feel that for the management, especially in like conservation of different species, whether it be like ocean species or land species who also don't really follow borders, it's really, really essential that like the US and Canada are working together, that um, people who are from indigenous nations that 
are centered on the border. Like there's lots of nations on the border, like the Okanagan Nation, um, a lot of our different Salish nations that are bisected by the border and don't have access to a lot of the same resources that they would have had on the other sides of the border pre-colonization. So I think we really need to introduce whatever systems we can to allow people to access those resources and also to protect those resources since part of the responsibility of having a traditional territory is the responsibility to protect your resources. So I think that there needs to be more collaboration and more chance for Indigenous peoples to do so, regardless of which side of the medicine line they're from. Thank you. Um, somebody else is asking uh, specifically if you can think of any kind of action that the forestry industry can take to reduce the occurrence of violence towards Indigenous women, non-violently people, two-spirit folks on industry and or crown land. Yeah, um, I think man camps are definitely like one of the largest dangers, it's like at least in BC towards indigenous women, like any towns or geographical areas where you put together a lot of industry workers who are isolated from their own communities for a long time and also don't really carry much responsibility to the communities that they're staying in. They don't have any accountability to those communities once they leave. Like anywhere geographically that that happens is going to create danger to indigenous women and to spirit and girls because these people don't have, like I said, like accountability to these communities. And oftentimes they'll leave and never come back to these communities again and they don't have to deal with the repercussions of their actions. So when people are so isolated from their own families and own communities, they'll take violent actions against communities around them and there's no accountability there. So definitely making sure that we're not participating in building of man camps and those kinds of things is important. Um, I don't know whether there's, there's other things we can do at the educational level to help break down some of these systemic racism issues that people are learning. Um, but even before they enter industry, like if we maybe if we talk about these issues at the most basic level, even when people are receiving their education, maybe they would go out into the world and not perpetuate these same harms that are being perpetuated right now, mostly by people who are completely uneducated and don't have the resources to learn about systemic racism and about their actions. So I think definitely more education is important. I guess I, I suppose that could even be done at the industry level, like within companies, giving resources and trainings and making sure people are educated in these issues and trying to break down the systemic racism and institutional racism within companies themselves. Like any of those actions that we could take would at least, I don't know, I think they would help. I have no answer. <laughs> but I think that would help. Yes, this, this is all very helpful. I uh, just want to be mindful. We have five more minutes and many questions. Uh, yeah. I will anticipate that we might not cover all the questions. So uh, I will try to, to cover a few more. So what's your advice to help us who are non-native uh, to be supportive and active uh, allies? Definitely start by educating yourself on what's really going on. Um, I know University of Alberta is offering an online course about Indigenous history within Canada. You can look that up. It's probably a good place to start, especially if you don't know much or anything about Indigenous history within Canada. Um, following and uplifting Indigenous voices on social media accounts. So if you have an Instagram or a Twitter, or Facebook or TikTok or whatever, go follow Indigenous peoples who are talking about these issues so that you stay in the loop with what is happening on the ground right now. Um, redistributing your wealth. So if you have a bit of money left over at the end of the month, you want to donate it. It's like finding Indigenous organizations that are doing work on the ground, on the front lines to help solve some of these problems like donating your money there so whether that be clean water funds whether that be 
frontline camps that are doing work trying to protect people from industrial activities, whether that be um, funds to try to help find missing relatives and family members, like all of these things are helpful. All of these things like are usually like in desperate need of funds and even a little bit of money like goes a really long way. I know at least on the front lines, like a little bit of money goes a really long way to like buying food, buying firewood, like getting the resources that we need as frontline workers to like continue doing the work on the ground that we're doing. So definitely redistributing some of your wealth and then just showing up as well. Like if you know that there's an action going on somewhere in the city, like it's so easy to go for a few hours to like go down to the port and help with the port blockades or go down to an intersection blockade or even go to one of the big rallies at the art gallery. Like there's so many ways that you can physically show up and protect indigenous bodies who are putting themselves on the line to defend our rights. So like just show up, give your money, educate yourself, make sure you're not perpetuating harm and really just examine your own biases and make sure you're not bringing those into your work. So Sally Aiken is uh, commenting on a, prof uh, a conversation you both have uh, and how profoundly impacted was she and that made uh, her making some changes in her class materials. Um, she's saying uh, she feel uh, still a bit short bringing traditional eco ecological knowledge into the forest biology class she teaches. And is asking if you can, um, if you know of any good examples within the faculty or outside of inf incorporating indigenous knowledge into biology classes beyond just traditional plant use? Hmm, gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I definitely think that if you're teaching a course, like oh, I'm specifically trying to think of like 211 now, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't know, just generally making sure that the indigenous knowledge that you're incorporating into classes isn't purely just like knowledge of ethnobotany and like how to use plants and what plants are culturally important, but also bringing in like, oh gosh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not really sure if I can think of any examples specifically within forestry. I mean, Jeanette Bolkin does a really good job. Um, Jeanette Bolkin does a really good job of bringing in lots of different aspects of traditional knowledge into coursework, where it's not just ecological knowledge, but also bringing in like social issues and environmental issues. So I guess like if you find a place within your own course material that you think there are social dynamics or um, political dynamics that you can like bring in to your own coursework, like try. If you are like teaching like just a course that is strictly about plants and you're like, I don't know how to incorporate these other things into your classes, like, yeah, like just talk about plants, but make sure that you're incorporating knowledge from a whole bunch of different groups, making sure you're incorporating knowledge that has been given, not extracted making sure that like the source of all of the knowledges that you're bringing in that you have like permission to use it. Um, just making sure that the knowledge that you are bringing in is like accurate and well meaning. Oh, that's such a good question. And that's that's a, a great answer. And and with that, uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining and give a special thanks to Ariel for their talk. Um, I'd like also to thank Professor Sara Gergel and Hisham Serifi for their committee work towards this and other EDI initiatives. Um, and to close, please keep checking the forestry channels as we will be sharing with you um, more content uh, regarding equity, diversity and in inclusion and anti-racism. Uh, there is a podcast coming on too. And also Ariel is organizing a forest reads uh, so please uh, keep in touch and be active and let's let's take Ariel's advices to action and especially stay safe everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you Ariel. <laughs>